Yeah, we were talking about where there are threats in terms of fracking, for instance, or large solar arrays, um, where that might increase buy-in, as we talked about with Borkham, um, where you might have a community energy project that starts on the back of a threat. But um, some on the table felt that was a little bit too negative and that maybe it's better if it's a positive thing where there's a tangible benefit for the community. Um, the key area for us was the, was the money and the return on the investment for people um, and to be able to demonstrate that return on investment. Um, and we were talking about a project in Clevedon area, um, which um, our colleague was involved in, where there was a tangible return. And that was largely down to the fit and the level of um, the feed-in tariff. And that was considered vital in getting these projects off the ground. Um, and also we talked about how there's a direct benefit for the community in terms of cheaper electricity if um, the scheme is connected to the grid. Um, but we talked about the challenges with that because very often there isn't the infrastructure for cabling um, in a rural area and there are you know, costs and challenges in actually getting the projects uh, directly connected to the grid. Um, we also talked about schemes which might um, encourage people um, such as the rent a roof scheme where companies put solar panels on roo householders roofs uh, the householder benefits from cheaper electricity and the company gets a feed-in tariff so it's kind of a win-win but there are legal complications with that with putting solar panels on people's roofs um, we also talked about how the return can be maximized by um, promoting energy efficiency, so where there, there are allied measures like loft insulation, window insulation schemes, so to show that people can save even more money um, by putting in energy efficiency. Um, we talked about ground source heating, how that can be used, say, for village halls, which further reduce costs. Um, we also talked about the fact that in many rural areas the heating is powered by oil, which is very expensive for people, and that actually a really good um, promotional aspect might be you know cheaper heating through electricity um, if that could be done and it would be a really good target pe to target people with oil powered heating to um, perhaps you know sell the benefits of solar panels and um, electricity that way um, another good way of getting buy-in we thought was by um, young people lobbying and the, the influence of young people because they learn about climate change at school uh, and they may well be um, more so enthusiastic about um, those sort of issues. And we were talking about a project in Hackney where there are 10 young interns from the estate who are paid to work on the Hackney Energy Project, which is a really interesting project my colleague here spoke about. Um, and those people, are young people, are paid for by grant. So they're very involved, they talk about the project to their parents, their aunties and uncles, their family, they sort of have an influence that way. Um, anything else colleagues wanted to add that I've forgotten? No? That's okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, we didn't... Energy, yes, colleague, yeah, just very briefly, benefits. Um, so ensuring benefits are delivered, we talked about political leadership, support from government, but also um, allowing grassroots projects to flourish um, and another way of ensuring benefits are delivered is that um, you have the feed-in tariff that's currently on its way down but that's critical um, and the financial support for these schemes is critical. Um, maintenance contracts being right, problems expedited properly, reducing risk insurance, making that known to people. Um, and basically getting information about out about maximising returns and reducing expenditure and risk. We talked about another project in Hackney, which is where the benefits, financial benefits from cheaper electricity uh, are put into a community benefit fund. So that money can be used for other projects in the community, which we thought was a really good innovation, and which we'd like to know more about. Um, and also the educational benefits for young people and for everyone really on climate change and we thought that was a particularly good sell in areas prone to flooding so you know the tangible benefits of reducing climate change and reducing flooding risk um, so to kind of get that to get those benefits delivered for people the first point is, is actually what a lot of people are alluding to as well, is trying to bring it down to the personal level. What gains will they get from the scheme? And um, also, 
I think try to communicate to people as well what pain they might get from the scheme as well by joining in it. Um, a lot of people like a challenge, and if you can find people in your community who do like a challenge, it's really good to get them on board. Um, because you do need legal advice, you do need accountants, you do need people with communications expertise, and you do need people who just do things, um, particularly actually prepared to grind away and actually get the bills out to the people you're supplying electricity to, etc. Keep it simple, stupid. I don't think anybody did mention that one. But start with something really simple that people can actually understand and you can actually build upon. Um, one point I was very keen on was data. Um, we were very lucky to get a grant from DEC through the LEAF scheme. I think it was Local Energy Assessment Fund. That's right, yeah. Um, it was £60,000, which enabled us to do an awful lot. But that gave us a lot of data about our community, how many people are in fuel poverty, how many people are using electricity only to heat their homes, how many people's homes were really improperly insulated. And going back to the personal gain point, we actually discovered there were a number of houses that were so substandard they were ready to be almost condemned. So we actually approached the local authority and got some local grant aid to have their houses improved at the same time as doing the energy project. So that was an immediate gain for the people in the community. Clear phasing, somebody talked about a business plan, that's a similar sort of point. You know, let's get one simple solar PV project off the ground, let's expand that, let's look at the social housing need, maybe you can then look at a windmill, um, you know, where do we go from there? Perhaps we can do some biomass um, firing at the local school. Um, but by having that phase plan, it's, it's like running a business. You start off with your groundwork, you've got the confidence of your local community, you've got your first £28,000, and then how far can you really go? What other grant aid can you attract as well? You know, Marks and Spencers, Centrica. It's absolutely amazing the amount of funds that are available out there if you really scratch the service. Um, collaboration and networking. You know, find out in your community who it's really worth talking to. Somebody mentioned the builders on our table, um, the Women's Institute, the church groups, um, the, the youth groups, the school, all of these networks are really important to digging in um, to actually get the buy-in. Um, but, you know, talk to people. People will know who the networks are. Even the GP, for example, will have a very good idea of who, who makes things work in your community. Um, on making sure the benefits delivered, it comes back down to the business plan again, as somebody mentioned, clear um, statement of the community payback. I mean, in our instance, we promised, we don't, sorry, I keep saying promise, I shouldn't use that word. We say we're going to aim to give between 3 and 5% investment return, but it'll be down to the membership of the Industrial Providence Society to decide at its annual general meeting what the dividend will be. Um, so we're quite clear, and we've done our very best to communicate in simple language what the, um, the business plan is. Good communication. Um, we have a quarterly church magazine. We have a quarterly parish magazine. Nobody tends to read that as far as we're aware. But we do have quite a nice thing which goes out from the energy group, which is about how to save money, how to actually benefit from the things we're doing on energy. You know, for example, bulk oil buying is something you could look at maybe where you've got a lot of oil. Um, consumption. That was something we set up right at the beginning and that became hugely advantageous, although some people naturally said they could buy oil cheaper elsewhere, um, but it did kind of work. Um, one point that people haven't mentioned is, is absolutely vital on making sure the benefits live. You need a good, strong team. You do need the multi-skills in it and you need to make sure you've got a good, I'm going to say chairman, I'm allowed to, a good chairman to actually make sure that people um, you know, are pulled together or work together and are told when they're missing a deadline. You know, you've got to get your business plan ready by next Tuesday. Um, so somebody who's going to kick butt is actually really important. And if you do have differences and you're bound to as a group of volunteers, it's somebody who will actually help you sort out those differences between the group as well. Um, and then obviously what we're going to say back to you, because there's always a payback on these things, is we need bodies like CPRE, um, Community Energy Association, to help us get a, a stable legal framework together from government. Um, I was saying, I think it was autumn last year, the government said through the FCA it would review all the Industrial Providence Society legislation. Well, what did that mean to a group of six people in Suffolk I mean, just set up an Industrial Providence Society? It sounded like a nightmare. Um, fortunately, it didn't happen. I think it's been shelved now. But, you know, those kind of things coming from government or review of, review of the fit structure or whatever else, you can't work at our level with our level of ability and, and resourcing if the government's continually changing the legal framework or the financial framework. Thank you. We talked about the possibility of a, a village mapping project. So you, you look at a particular uh, village or a town and you see which um, areas would be good to allocate 
renewable energy such as solar panels and that sort of thing and which houses they could go on or which community buildings just to really get ideas flowing and get people involved. And the second thing that we thought was important was to make the economic arguments really clear so that it's not just a company coming in and taking the profits elsewhere but some sort of way of a community payback scheme so that they're making money from them, they're, they're owning these renewable energy sources and um, that might be a good way of persuading them. Um, with regards to how to make sure that these benefits are paid, we talked about the need for a pr protective structure. So you could have like a a contract or something, a written contract of wi what returns are to be given to the community, when money is to be paid, that sort of thing. Um, and we also talked about the need for long-term biodiversity monitoring to see if, if um, the claims made about what the biodiversity improvements would be um, where you have solar panels for instance on those partial land and if it if it is actually delivering those biodiversity 